lot of sacrifices made a hundred years ago and more, and we're still benefiting from all of what happened in those days. Uh, Declan, to start with, Peter, he, he was a Kilkenny man. That's right, uh, very much a Kilkenny man, uh, very proud of uh, the city where he was born. Um, his father uh, was an iron founder and a very strong Fenian, uh, as was his mother, Bridget. And uh, they ran a foundry business in Parliament Street, Kilkenny. And Peter inherited that along with his brothers and uh, worked uh, there, uh, having been given uh, knowledge of how to found metal and indeed many other uh, talents that his father gave him, which were to be used later in his life to great effect. Like many young men of his time, he became interested in the, first of all, I think, in the GAA, and then later in other organizations that followed, such as the Gaelic League and eventually the Volunteers and so on. But even even from the very start, he, he was an enthusiastic member of all of these organizations. He was. He became swept up by this Irish Ireland movement. And uh, again, his father had some effect on him here because his father was involved in setting up the first GAA branch in Kilkenny, and uh, when it got into trouble, when there was inter nissan battles going on within the GAA, his father Richard um, saved the GAA at the time. Uh, it came under a lot of criticism from the Catholic Church, in particular from uh, Bishop Brownrigg um, the, of the Diocese of Osseray. So, uh, what was his problem with the GAA? Uh, he felt that it was Fenian-esque and he wasn't yes. too wrong uh, in his uh, assumption. Yes. And, uh, you know, he would have put posters up or had them put up, uh, you know, against the GAA in particular, say, advising people not uh, to attend GAA meetings. Uh, these were put up on, on church guests. All to little or no effect. Uh, none whatsoever. And indeed, this confrontation that Peter's father, uh, Richard, had with the Catholic Church uh, continued with Peter because later in his life he had several confrontations. But just going back to the uh, 1890s and early 1900s, Peter did be become uh, in very much involved in the GAA and very much involved in acting and, yes. and we had plays that were put on uh, as part of the Irish Ireland movement. Yes, and the Gaelic League, of course. Yes. Did uh, he learn Irish? He was, uh, and he attended Irish classes with his brother Larry. And uh, later in life, he did give a speech in Irish. I think he would have had a limited knowledge of Irish, yes. but he was, uh, he did try to speak and he did try to learn it. Yes, of course, he wouldn't have had the opportunity of learning it at school. No. All of this would have been learned in his own time. Classes and so on. That's right. And uh, as a politician in later life, he complained regularly about the fact that uh, the civil service, i.e., Dublin Castle, yes. was not putting on Irish classes. Yes. And uh, in a normal society or an average society, uh, these um, events, such as learning Irish or uh, putting other issues like that on the curricula, these would have been done by a civil service, and um, the Irish Ireland movement uh, saw themselves as the civil service. Yes. They were being self-sufficient and putting on Irish classes, which they did in Roth House. There was sort of a, a parallel state almost, which ultimately developed into, into the Doyle era. That's right. Yeah. So he became then, when the, when the volunteers came on the scene, again he was one of the, the first in. One of the first in, uh, he was elected first of all to the corporation in 1912. But uh, yeah, with regard to the volunteer movement, he was a wildly enthusiastic member and was a leader. Uh, he knew and met um, Sir Roger Casement in Kilkenny, and he was uh, responsible for the subscription role. Yes. And uh, extremely involved uh, in it. And of course, it came a time where there was a split, as there is always at yes. some point, um, between those who supported John Redmond of the Irish Party, who wanted to pursue a constitutional way of having a, a home rule, a New Ireland, and then the other group, 
uh, which didn't really see Redmond or the Irish party as successful, had never yes. been in their view, and Peter took that line. And that was, that was the much smaller group, of course. It was indeed, and uh, there was a confrontation in Kilkenny between the two groups in the market yard, and uh, one of the people there said you could have lent the air, uh, it was like a tinderbox. Yes. Uh, it was so aggressive, the two sides. So then, 1916 came along then. That's right, and um, there was a lot of toing and froing between Peter de Lucre's uh, shop in Kilkenny, his hardware shop in the hardware and foundry. And uh, <clears throat> it was like a post office almost from people coming down from Dublin with yes. uh, messages about yes. the planned rising. And uh, de Lucre, uh, uh, along with all of the other Republicans in Kilkenny, decided that the person who would uh, decide for them what to do would be Owen McNeil, not anyone else. And uh, when his countermanding order came in the Sunday Independent yes. to call everything off, they it went with was obeyed. Yes. It was obeyed. So was he interned then after the rising? He was, uh, yes, interned. Although, although he hadn't, they hadn't, there had been no action in Kilkenny. No, there hadn't been any action in Kilkenny, but uh, a very astute uh, RIC inspector, Pierce C. Power, um, found a gun on the premises and also some memorabilia about republicanism, yes. harmless in itself. But uh, he, along with his brother and many other Kilkenny Republicans, were rounded up and interned in Wakefield Prison. And how long was he there? He was there only about two months or so. And uh, there, were, there were letters that have survived. Uh, and you can see in them, these are letters he sent to his sister yes. Elizabeth, uh, the anger at being incarcerated without a charge. Yes. He was extremely angry about this. And uh, it comes across in the letters. But uh, it seems the British decided that as these people hadn't been involved in any action, that was no point in detaining them That's for right. too long. And uh, indeed, uh, the RIC inspector of power uh, he sent monthly reports to Dublin. Yes. This was done all over the country, to Dublin Castle. Yes. And uh, he describes that after the uh, rising, people were generally apathetic or they were, oh, some were angry they couldn't get bread or milk. Yes. And it was only when they started executing the leaders that it all turned against them, uh, against the British yes. uh, administration. And then, of course, uh, Following the release of the internees, Sinn Féin began to organise and go for by-elections and local elections and that's right. so on, and eventually, eventually succeeded in, in the 1918 election. Yes, and indeed, uh, just a real, uh, year previously, yes. uh, William T. Cosgrave won the by-election in Kilkenny. Yes. And this was the first marker, one of the first markers of this surge for Sinn Féin. And total draining of support for the Irish party. And as you said, the 1918 general election came and it was an enormous success for Sinn Féin. And it, it marked a change from the Irish party constitutional careful uh, process of politics to a more virulent and aggressive form. 